Thank you, Eva. Um, I'm going to talk about the optimal use of lenalidomide as therapy for myelodysplastic syndromes and uh, would like to remind you that in lower risk myelodysplastic syndromes, the approval of lenalidomide has only been granted for isolated DEL5Q in the European Union. It's different from the United States, but for isolated DEL5Q with low or intermediate one risk myelodysplastic syndromes. So it's not approved for non DEL5Q. It's not approved for DEL5Q with additional abnormalities and with excess blasts. So this is an important caveat, and I'm going to talk about many off label uses in the next couple of minutes. What we know from the uh, international partly randomized trial, the MDS004 trial, um, is that um, lenalidomide at a dose of 10 milligrams or 5 milligrams obviously uh, improves uh, hematopoiesis in patients with DEL5Q. You see uh, 50 to 60 percent of patients with IWG responses and obviously with, uh, um, uh, with placebo these responses are very, very low indeed. And the duration of response is about two years, uh, whether you use uh, 5 milligrams or 10 milligrams. Um, if you look at patients with uh, the, the subgroup of patients with isolated DEL5Q that, was, uh, that were included in the uh, MDS-004 trial, what you can see is that um, the... Uh, red blood cell transfusion independence on 10 milligrams was about 57%, so no uh, tremendous difference. And you see that the cytogenetic response rate was 55, 56, 57% with 10 milligrams. And this is also not uh, tremendously different to those patients who had additional chromosomal abnormalities. And therefore, I think uh, it's um, uh, probably relatively um, restrictive uh, approval of lenalidomide to patients with isolated L5Q only. Um, you see that the cytogenetic remission rate uh, in um, patients with 5 milligrams of lenalidomide was lower. Now, this includes major and minor cytogenetic remissions. So, major remission means that there are no Del5Qs. DEL5Q uh, uh, cells detectable anymore, and minor response means uh, at least 50% of clearance of DEL5Q. And um, if you look at patients uh, with isolated DEL5Q and their survival uh, in the MDS-04 study, what you see is what uh, Eva Hellström Lindberg has already uh, alluded to, is that patients who are uh, deemed ineligible for erythropoietin or have experienced erythropoietin in the first place do actually not do that well with an overall survival of only four years in this, in this uh, trial. And you have seen this curve before uh, or a similar uh, curve before. Those patients who do actually respond do much better than those who do not respond. In isolated DEL5Q, they do actually a little better than the overall cohort because you see that the uh, median uh, is probably around six years or so. Now, um, the um, LEMON5 trial, which was initiated in Germany at the time when lenalidomide was used in MDS-003 and 004, but patients could not enter those trials anymore. Um, uh, Len uh, the LEMON5 trial was uh, set up just to, imp the, the, to allow patients with isolated DEL5Q and the blast count of below 5% to enter, uh, to enter uh, treatment uh, with lenalidomide. And what you can see is that in this truly lower risk MDS DEL5Q population, as I would put it, the uh, transfusion independence rate was about 67%, and the major and minor cytogenetic uh, uh, response rate was 83%. So that's considerably higher than we have, uh, we have seen in the uh, mixed group of isolated DEL5Q Del <coughs> isolated DEL5Q plus additional aberrations plus a blast count of uh, uh, up to 10%, uh, but you still see a substantial 
uh, amount of patients who will have AML progression, and that is about 23%. However, if you compare this to patients who had uh, who were screen failures. That means patients who had one additional chromosomal aberration, for instance, trisomy 21, or who had 5%, 6%, 7% of blast, but were still low or intermediate one MDS patients, those could not actually enter the trial, and they were followed up, and you see that 27% of those patients also did progress to acute myeloid leukemia. Now, interestingly enough, uh, 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 the Mannheim group did TP53 mutation analysis in this trial, and you see that 67 of those patients actually underwent uh, TP53 screen with a median age of 70, male to female ratio as you would expect for lower risk DEL5Q, and you see that the response rate of those patients who had uh, TP53 mutation was not statistically significantly lower. It was numerically lower, but not statistically significantly lower. And the TP53 status did actually not affect cytogenic remission rate or transfusion independence rate. The survival with patients with TP53 mutations was significantly lower for those patients who were mutated versus those patients who had uh, TP53 wild type, but the progression-free survival was not uh, statistically significantly lower. Another question is, in the patients who had complex DEL5Q, which means two additional chromosomal aberrations, in the MDS-003 and MDS-004 study, also some, some of those patients actually entered the trial because they were low or intermediate one-risk myelodysplastic syndrome, which means they had less than 5% blast. And when you look at those, we actually uh, tried and compared those who had uh, 17P uh, deletion, uh, 3Q abnormality or monosomal carrier types, and called those actually bad risk uh, additional chromosomal aberrations to those who had other uh, aberrations and who were called uh, good risk chromosomal aberrations. And you see that uh, surprisingly enough, those patients with complex chromosomal abnormalities but so-called good risk aberrations, they still did relatively well with a median overall survival of about three and a half to four years for the good risk additional chromosomal abnormality is not that much different, I would say, to, it was different, actually, it's lower than the overall patient population, but it's not that dramatically different that you would probably expect, while those patients with bad additional chromosomal abnormalities do actually do, do actually very, poor, uh, very poorly. And you see that the transfusion independence rate is actually 57% for those patients who have the additional good risk chromosomal abnormalities. And the cytogenetic uh, response rate is low numbers, I must say. It's only 14 patients, and the poor risk abnormality is only 7. But it's interesting to see that there seems to be a difference uh, uh, between those uh, uh, patient cohorts. So when we use uh, lenalidomide, let me tell you that if you use lenalidomide in DEL5Q, you may see different uh, um, uh, characteristics in the, the treatment uh, cohorts. One category of patients, like the 10%, will probably increase with the hemoglobin, will do very well, have a, a drop in uh, white blood cells, drop in platelet count, but then do very well, recover the hemoglobin, and, and continue like this. Then you have about 50% who will have dramatic dramatic, more or less dramatic drops in platelet counts and neutrophil counts, and we need to watch those patients very closely because they may actually uh, undergo serious uh, therapy-related uh, um, uh, therapy uh, complications, including um, uh, bleeding and uh, infections. And finally, you have patients who actually improve their hemoglobin count 
but it doesn't normalize and you have them you see those patients with with reduction in neutrophil counts reduction in platelet counts and they actually do not tend to do particularly well and they don't remain uh, transfusion independent for a long, a long period of time and then finally you have those patients who do not respond at all and this is about 30 percent or 40 percent of, of the entire patient population now some patients will relapse and not all those patients who do relapse after lenalidomide treatment do actually uh, progress or will not um, uh, respond again to lenalidomide. For instance, if you look at this lady who had actually uh, a nice hemoglobin increase, but then dropped with the hemoglobin again, we just stopped for lenalid with lenalidomide treatment just for the, for, for the one single reason that we didn't have anything else uh, to offer. But after three or four months, we restarted lenalidomide, and she had a second response. And when she dropped again, well, obviously, we did the same thing. We waited for four to six months and then reintroduced lenalidomide. And some of those patients will actually get several responses to lenalidomide. Now, I uh, must say that if you uh, look further into this curve, this lady actually, at month uh, 52, developed acute myeloid leukemia. So the question was, what happens to the patients who actually take lenalidomide and then have to stop lenalidomide for some reason? Maybe because they don't tolerate the drug anymore because of side effects or because they actually wish to stop. Because there are some patients who say, I have achieved complete cytogenetic remission, complete hematopoietic remission. Why do you keep actually treating me. And if you look at those patients, and we did this with the King's group, uh, with Austin uh, um, uh, uh, contributing a lot of patients to this analysis, we have seen that those patients who actually achieved complete cytogenetic remission, when they stopped treatment, they did actually pretty well. And if you look at those patients who actually had the complete cytogenetic remission for more than six months, and you look at those patients uh, uh, stopping lenalidomide, some of those patients are actually ongoing transfusion independent 10 and more years after stopping uh, uh, lenalidomide. So let me switch gears in lenalidomide in high-risk MDS patients. Obviously, this is not approved. This is intermediate to and high-risk IPSS. And Lionel Ades has presented data on this subpopulation of, of, of DEL5Q patients and has shown that, interestingly, those patients who have an isolated DEL5Q, even if they have a higher, MD, uh, and a higher blast count, 60 to 70% of those patients may actually achieve a complete remission but the median complete remission duration is very short with about 11 months and uh, uh, most of those patients will uh, uh, definitely relapse. I have brought uh, one patient uh, who uh, couldn't actually be treated with lenalidomide in 2004 and because she, all, she had an isolated DEL5Q uh, but she had 7% of blast and went straight up to um, uh, uh, allogeneic stem cell transplantation. I've brought this in, in, in German. This is the report of uh, University of Essen Transplant uh, Center who actually transplanted her in 2004. And uh, she, was, she was doing okay. In uh, 2005, they stopped everything, cyclosporin, steroids, etc. And she had a complete donor chimerism uh, in, uh, uh, until actually uh, two until uh, uh, until uh, 12 2016 and in february 2017 she unfortunately relapsed with a complex karyotypic abnormality including del 5q in all metaphases uh, that you can see above and you had eight normal metaphases um, and this lady actually has uh, remained um, uh, transfusion independent, uh, independent until now she does have neutropenia she does have thrombocytopenia but she just saw me with this karyotype and asked whether she should go for another transplant she's now 73 and the first donor, who was her brother, actually died from cardiac complications. But she has a second brother who is actually also a full match. 
and she might go for a second transplant with this patient. Just to mention that, uh, you know, EFAS group, uh, together with the Oxford group, have looked into uh, Del5Q patients treated with lenalidomide and shown that, uh, uh, that Del5Q might persist in very early stem cells. And it appears that, or at least in this patient, might appear that uh, some Del5Q clone might have hibernated for a very, very long time in, uh, in, in this patient and, and come up again, uh, although it's not excluded. This, this is the second uh, uh, clone that has emerged uh, 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 a decade after, after transplantation. Interestingly enough, in molecular genetics, you see that there is no ASXL1, uh, no Sybil, EZH2, U2, uh, AF1, or SF3B1, but there is a TP50, uh, TP53 gene mutation uh, that, has been, um, that has been identified by the Munich uh, MLL lab in this particular patient. Um, so, uh, let me switch to non-Del5Q. Again, this is, this is uh, 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 treatment which is off-label and which is not uh, approved um, in uh, any country, uh, to my knowledge. And uh, lenalidomide has shown that it might lead to about 20 to 25 percent of uh, erythroid responses uh, in those patients who had actually a low probability of response to erythropoietin or who had been treated with erythropoietin before. And uh, if you look at the mutations in this study, you see that uh, you know, many of those patients have had SF3B1 mutations for ring sideroblastic uh, phenotype. Others had TET2, ASXL1, DNMT3A mutations. And interestingly enough, the response rate, although most of those patients had, according to in the inclusion criteria, a low probability of response to uh, erythropoietin, when, we, when you look at the response rate, those with the lowest erythropoietin levels had actually the highest response rates to lenalidomide in non-Del5Q disease. But an erythroid differentiation signature, which was proposed by Ben Ebert's group previously, uh, actually did not, did not uh, recapitulate in, the, uh, in this study uh, and could not be shown. So as a final comment, uh, I would like to uh, draw your attention on second primary malignancies because we talk a lot about second primary malignancies in patients with, um, uh, treated with lenalidomide and multiple myeloma. In patients with Del5Q and non-Del5Q all lumped together, uh, there was a uh, calculation of the incidence rate in 100 patient years uh, for second primary malignancies in patients treated with lenalidomide. And this incidence rate was not obviously not compared in a randomized fashion to uh, patients not treated, but it was shown that the overall invasive second primary malignancy rate was 2.6, excluding actually acute myeloid leukemia, because this was, um, uh, this was uh, seen as the normal uh, uh, development of a, a myeloid or a possible development of a myeloid disease. But for uh, uh, other uh, uh, malignancies, it was about 2.6, and that was compared to the, to, the, to the normal population at the same age, which was about 2.4. So it seems to be relatively safe to say that second primary malignancies are probably not a big problem in lenalidomide-treated uh, uh, myeloid uh, disease patients. Now, uh, hematological side effects I alluded to, but non-hematological side effects include, I think it's important to say, pruritus, skin lesions, and importantly, diarrhea. And some of our patients actually stop treatment with lenalidomide after years of ongoing uh, uh, lenalidomide treatment because of diarrhea. Uh, uh, others will have myalgias, I, others will have cramps of hands and, and, and legs, dry skin, and uh, rarely actually thrombosis, but it does happen uh, to see thrombosis in patients with uh, uh, Del5Q, so I tend to actually uh, 
um, uh, treat patients with, pre with antecedents of uh, venous or arterial thrombosis who undergo lenalidomide treatment with uh, anticoagulant uh, disease. Open questions, obviously, is uh, can we treat uh, DEL5Q patients in non-approved indications, which means uh, with additional chromosomal abnormalities, should we actually treat patients who have a trisomy 8 or who do have a DEL, uh, uh, who, who, who do have trisomy 21 or something? I actually personally do this. Uh, the next question is when should treatment be initiated? Uh, the ELN guidelines say that um, you should actually start uh, treating patients with uh, erythropoietin and to, uh, take lenalidomide, lenalidomide as a second line uh, treatment. Uh, the question is, if you have a high EPO level, which is not that rare in DEL5Q patients, should you actually wait for transfusion dependence or can you actually uh, start with lenalidomide treatment and then stop lenalidomide treatment at some point when you when you get uh, into remission and wait just and see what happens. Um, uh, do we have to fear uh, the uh, um, upcoming of uh, malignant clones with uh, um, unfortunate, uh, chromos um, uh, up unfortunate mutations, etc.? Then can treatment be resumed after failure? Uh, how long do you have to wait after failure to resume treatment? Or should you go immediately into allogen stem cell transplantation, which obviously is, uh, would be the treatment of choice in the, younger, in the younger patient, and can treatment be interrupted? And there are several studies that will come up. There is one uh, international collaborative study that looks actually into earlier versus delayed treatment with lenalidomide, which means into uh, non-transfusion dependent versus transfusion dependent patients. And there's another uh, study that is actually being, uh, um, which is going to come up that looks into interruption of treatment with lenalidomide in patients who do have a response. And then the question is what is appropriate in patients with P53 mutations and what in DEL17P? Because as a matter of fact, the, Len the Lemon uh, 5 trial did show that patients who actually developed uh, uh, 17p uh, deletions or mutations did not actually fare worse than those patients who did not. Uh, and there is conflicting data from other study groups who actually show that once you have 17p deletion or 17p mutations that happen, that then the probability of AML increases extremely. And finally, uh, is there a role for combinations with, for instance, EPO? There is data showing that combination with EPO might actually improve response rate uh, um, when you use it with lenalidomide. And what about other combinations like with azacitidine in higher risk MDS patients uh, with DEL5Q or um, cytarabin? And uh, some very few patients might have hypoplastic DEL5Q, and in hypoplastic DEL5Q, you might want to actually immune, uh, treat those patients with immunosuppression. Uh, you might actually want to transplant them immediately. It's very few patients, but they, these patients exist, and this is an open question what to do, and it's probably important to discuss those patients with a transplant center uh, and uh, within a multi um, multi-collaborative uh, effort at uh, different clinics. With that, I would like to close and uh, thank you and I'm waiting for your questions.